discussion meeting for 2021. Um, it, uh, it, it's, it, at this time of year, we like to focus on evolution a little bit because it's traditional for us to uh, celebrate Darwin's birthday and uh, have a picnic get together on the 12th of, uh, of February. Uh, this year we had it all set up and then the lockdown um, cut across those plans. But nonetheless, um, it's been marvelous that Dr. Irene Gallego Romero, uh, who is working in the evolutionary uh, area, has been able to uh, offer us some time this evening to talk about her work. Before we get started, though, I thought for those who, who are not, who are joining us tonight, who are not humanists, I might just read a, a short statement about uh, what Humanists Victoria um, aims to do. So we aim to build a more civilized society, fostering ethics based on human values. We consider that reason, free inquiry, and a scientific approach enable us to understand our universe and our place in it. We defend freedom and democracy and human rights and provide a positive alternative to religious and dogmatic creeds. We support separation of church and state and secular education. So that's just a brief summary in general terms of what our goals are. Uh, in addition to that, I'd like to make an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'm tonight on Wurundjeri territory, Wurundjeri country, and you are possibly meeting, we are probably uh, all on different uh, lands, so I'll leave you to sort of privately make an acknowledgement, uh, make the acknowledgement that uh, this territory was never ceded and uh, to pay my respects to uh, any elders past, present and emerging. So um, when we think about human evolution, I mean, what comes to my mind is the picture of someone who's probably at the end of a shovel or um, squatting on their haunches, sort of brushing uh, dust off bones that have emerged from a pit or a, a, some work that they're, they're doing, or some workplace that they're doing. But um, Arin Gallego Romero is of uh, the more modern school because what uh, has happened in the last few decades is that uh, genetic, uh, found at that location. genetic research has really opened up this field uh, hugely. So she works in her laboratory uh, and she's studying how changes in DNA sequence contribute to human and primate evolution. She works both in the human and chimpanzee space uh, and looking at both recent and ancient uh, specimens. Uh, she's currently a senior lecturer in systems genetics at the School of Biosciences and the Center for Stem Cell Systems at the University of Melbourne. Uh, since moving to Australia in 2017, her research has focused on the evolutionary challenges of peopling island Southeast Asia. In other words, um, I think it's fair to say sort of Papua New Guinea and the Indonesian archipelago. So um, please, uh, Welcome, uh, Dr. Romero. And in order to, she is in the first instance going to give her give us a fairly technical uh, explanation of how the genetic material can be understood and the genetic differences can be uh, made evident. But at the end of her talk, she'd be very happy to have a wide ranging discussion about the implications of that. So uh, I want to encourage you very much to put your questions into the chat space. And Paul Thompson uh, is going to keep an eye on the chat space and we possibly won't be able to deal with absolutely everybody's questions, but some of them are probably going to um, uh, be able to be uh, grouped together uh, in, in themes. So uh, please, please uh, uh, start 
contributing to the chat space so that at the end of uh, Irene's talk, we can move straight on to um, a discussion about what it is that uh, you want to understand about what her work is, is telling us. So without anything further, uh, I'd like to welcome um, Irene and ask her to speak to us. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jenny. That's a lovely introduction. Um, like Jenny said, I'm very happy to take questions on this on the subject of the talk, but also range a bit further afield at the end of the, of the talk. Um, it is a bit of a technical talk, but it's not as technical as, as you might dread, I hope, hopefully successful. And here, sorry, I have a special guest. I have two special guests who will come and go, I'm sorry. Um, sit down, friend. All right, so yes, so I wanna talk really about this, this idea of encounters in the Indonesian archipelago and, and peopling the Indonesian archipelago, right? And as Jenny said, when, when you think about human evolution, you might expect that today's talk might feature perhaps Homo flores, Homo floresiensis, who was discovered around 15 years ago and who lived in the Indonesian island of Flores between a million and a hundred thousand years ago, give or take, there is a lot of uncertainty around these dates. Not gonna talk about that one. You might perhaps hope to hear instead then about Homo luzonensis who lived in the Philippine island of Luzon and was discovered last year or two years ago. And again, was there between a million and a hundred thousand years ago. Also not gonna talk about that one. You might then perhaps hope that I will actually talk about whoever the artist of this beautiful worthy pig is. This is the oldest example of animal art known to humans. It's in the Indonesian cave in the Indonesian island of Sulawesi and you can see the, the handprint of the artist perhaps. Can you see my cursor? Hold on. I always forget to fix this little part. Uh -huh. You think we would all be better at Zoom at this point. But now you can see my cursor. So you might be wondering, could we see who is the artist of this beautiful, again, the oldest known of art. I actually have no idea who painted it. And I think there is a couple of contenders we can talk about who might have done it. But again, that's not what I'm here to do, right? You haven't, in fact, been slightly bamboozled because like Jenny said, I am an anthropologist, but I work on DNA. So my research happens in a laboratory, it happens in front of cell lines, or it happens in a supercomputer. And neither of these might fit the assumption of, of what you think human evolutionary biologists might do. But it is in fact a fairly, there is a fairly large number of one of us, right? Um, and so today's talk is indeed about islands of East Asia and the Indonesian archipelago, but I do need to disclaim a few things. And the first thing is that again, there are precisely three fossils in this talk and you've seen two of them. And there are zero references to Charles Darwin in this talk, despite it being coinciding with the society's celebration of Charles Darwin, right? What there is in this talk instead is DNA, is your genomes. And the reason I wanna spend some of my time talking about genomes and DNA in general is that DNA is kind of ubiquitous these days. Like it's in everything, right? It's a genetic blueprint. It contains instructions to build you. And like, if you go online and search for advertisements, it's in the DNA of this company to be excellent and in the DNA of that company to do something else, blah, 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 blah. But it's also a bit kind of mysterious, it's a bit intangible. It accounts for your risk of depression, it accounts for your risk of Alzheimer's, of cancer. If you Google hard enough again, you can find any trait of yours that DNA contributes to, but how does it do it? How does it actually work? So to me, I've always really been a, a big fast, passionate fan of DNA. And so I really think it's worth taking the time to talk about DNA and especially about our DNA, right? So here it is, the human genome. It's got 23 pairs of chromosomes from big ones to small ones. It's got the famous pair of XY chromosomes where this individual was a male, X and a Y chromosome, woman would have two X chromosomes. It was kind of like this. Okay. Here is the average Australian. The, and you know it's the average Australian because the average Australian is 1.725 meters tall. So there you have it, right? And this average Australian individual has 37.2 trillion cells in their body. And inside each of those cells, and inside each of your cells and my cells, obviously, there is a copy of that genome, of those 23 chromosomes that I just showed you. So if I were to take a single cell from this individual and fish out that DNA and stretch it out, right, take those chromosomes and stretch it out, I would get two meters of DNA in each of the 37 trillion cells. That's a lot of material, right? In a very, very small space because the DNA in each of these cells is packed into, my cat clicked away from my presentation, there you go. It's packed into the nucleus of the cell and the nucleus of the cell is 
between two and five micrometers thick. So if you think of a millimeter, take a thousandth of that and fit two meters of information in it. So it's a bit of a daunting proposition, right? But it really is, is like that. And, and the reason I've drawn the cell here blue is because I like the color blue, but really that's also that's because when we do DNA work in the lab, we use a blue dye to stain DNA. And so this is really what it looks like under the microscope. These blue blobs here, this is the nucleus of a cell. Here you can see actually the chromosomes starting to separate here. It's a bit less condensed, but that's really what it looks like. It's just a little brown blob and shoved in there is the genome. And so, okay. All right, that's a bit of, that doesn't sound like the best way to store information, doesn't store like the best way to store blueprints, right? So maybe let's zoom in a bit closer. So here's our nucleus. Here's our nucleus now with chromosomes drawn in black, just because that's more or less what they look like. And again, zoom in a bit more. And if we take one of those chromosomes and stretch it out, you kind of might think that you get something like this, right? Each of these colored blobs here is a gene. We have the light green gene, the teal gene, the bright blue gene, the gray gene, et cetera. And they're interspersed in your genome in those two meters of information, sort of at randomly. There is a bit of disorder happening in here. It's a bit of a mess, to be quite honest with you, right? And so there is no table of contents. There is nothing of the sort. It's just DNA and a gene here and a gene there and a gene way over there and things like that. And so again, you might be kind of like, oh, that sounds a bit dubious. That's not perhaps what I, you know, how I would like to store information that's important. That's fair enough. Let's zoom in a bit closer into a single gene, right? So I'm going to keep drawing genes like this. Um, this long line here, whenever you see a single long line, that's DNA. That's a sort of the genome, right? And whenever you see a little black flash of color here, that's a gene. The arrow here, this little thing is an arrow. It simply means the beginning of the gene. And so the gene starts here and it ends there. And it's a gene. It's the bright green gene, right? And so in your body, what's happening when your gene gets turned on, whatever turned on means, and we'll come back to that. It gets, your body makes a copy of that DNA, each of your cells makes that copy of a molecule called RNA. And RNA is always going to be squiggly lines in this talk. And we won't see a lot of RNA, so, but whenever you see a squiggly line, RNA. And then the RNA gets further processed by your cells into proteins, right? So DNA becomes RNA, becomes protein, cool. Things happen. That's, that's kind of fundamentally how the system works. And so again, whenever you see a triangle in this talk, that's a protein. And hopefully it'll be obvious what's happening, but squiggly line RNA, triangle protein, and they will always match the color of the gene they came from, right? So the neon green DNA gene makes neon green RNA, which in turn gets made into neon green protein. Excellent. Now, though, we still have this problem of the fact that, again, we have 20,000 genes scattered through this genome, and one of them makes the green triangle, and another one makes the pink triangle, and the such, but each of your cells contain the same genome, right? But it's patently obvious that if we were to look inside ourselves, we would not mistake, I hope, our lungs, for our stomach, right? For our brain, for our liver, for our heart, for our kidney, for our skin, for whatever. You should be, you can tell these things apart. You can tell them apart by sight. You can tell them apart by function. You would never mistake the function of the brain for the function of the liver, I hope, right? And if we zoom in deeper into these tissues, we will find that actually, the cells that make up these tissues. So on the left here, you've got some muscle cells and you can tell they're muscle cells because of that green filament thing. That's what contracts and expands them. And on the right here, you've got a bunch of neurons. And in this case, the green here is that long tail of the neurons that you see. Whenever you see a drawing of a neuron, it always has a long tail. And that's what you're seeing here. And so these two cells look different. They have different functions. They have different roles. They are found in different tissues of your body but they both have the same genome. And so a question you might have, right, which is a perfectly fair question that I'm totally avoiding right now is, how does that work? How does that happen? How does your heart know that it should be a heart? How does your liver know that it should be a liver and it should be made out of liver cells? How does your lung know that it should not be made out of heart cells, right? How does that happen? Again, I'm gonna set aside that question. I will come back to it later, but I'm gonna sidestep that question and say, instead, let me tell you something else about DNA and set aside the hard question. This is actually a really hard question, but it's an interesting question, so we'll return to it. But again, let me tell you before I answer it, we need to talk about more, a bit more about the fundamentals of DNA. So if we go back to our, our average Australian and, and there are two meters of DNA, and then we take maybe my genome and line it up next to that of the average Australian. Again, 
two meters long. That's, you know, kind of like that. I don't know if my arms are in the camera. Oh, yeah, there you go. Um, we, and we, you know, line them up and start comparing them. On average, at every single millimeter, right? So like, we would find 1,500 different differences between me and the average Australian or between any pair of individuals in this zoom, in fact. So in total, across the two meters, we'd find around 3 million differences. That is a fair amount of differences, right? And again, a question you might have, a very sensible question is, well, what do these differences mean? Which of them are meaningful? Are all of them meaningful? Are any of them meaningful? And when I say differences, I'm talking about DNA mutations, right? Like the boogeyman of mutation. Many of these differences are totally benign or totally meaningless. They don't seem to have any role. They don't seem to have any consequence. Some of these differences, of course, explain perhaps my propensity for you know, having dark hair versus someone's propensity for having light hair, my brown eyes versus someone's blue eyes, my height, my weight, to the degree that these traits are genetically determined. Um, others explain the risk of getting cancer that runs in families, the risk of getting Alzheimer's that runs in families, the risk of getting Huntington's that runs in families, etc. But that's on aggregate. Individually pinpointing the role of any single difference, that's a lot harder. It's very hard to understand. You say, I've got, you know, I, I sequenced my genome and there was a difference at this position here, chromosome three, position 17 million, blah, blah, blah. What does it do? If you came to me with that question, I'd be like, I don't know. And I don't know also that anyone else knows because there is a lot of differences out there and most of them are hard to predict the consequences of, right? But one thing we can do though, is we can definitely draw figures about these differences. So if this line here, and again, line genome is let's say the reference human genome, then I can take another second individual and again, this can be me and we can compare it. And I'm gonna mark with a little star every single point where I differ from the reference human genome or from this comparison genome, whoever it is, right? And so I can do that for myself, do that for my friends, do that for your friends, et cetera. And I can easily depict then this set of differences across people in a very simple, hopefully straightforward visual manner, where again, I'm making no comments at all about their biological consequence, which of these is important, which of this contributes to heights. I'm simply saying, hey, at this point here, the reference genome has, let's say, an A, which is one of the four bases in DNA, and all of us here have a T. And in this point here, the reference human genome, and this person here, and that person here, and that person here all have a G. And the three of us with the orange mark, we all have a C. What does it mean? Don't know, but I can say we have it, right? Cool. Now that we've talked about that, now we can talk about Island Southeast Asia. So why do we want to talk about Island Southeast Asia? Island Southeast Asia, and I will define it, but pretty much, again, it is indeed the Indonesian archipelago and Papua New Guinea primarily, is a fantastic and a fascinating region of the world. It's been inhabited for quite a long time. We'll talk about the dates in a second. But it's also home to a staggering amount of genetic diversity, both in terms of the individuals like humans that live there, but also obviously in terms of its flora and its fauna. And in the human sphere, it's also home to a lot of cultural diversity and linguistic diversity. Over 800 languages are spoken in Papua New Guinea and 700 in Indonesia. So it's a very, very rich region of the world. It's a fascinating region of the world, right? And if we think about how humans got there, well, Humans evolved in Africa. The numbers in this figure are all a bit too recent. The arrows, however, are mostly correct. Um, this figure is four years old, and in the last four years, our knowledge, our estimates for all of these dates has changed. But humans evolved in Africa, Homo sapiens evolved in Africa around, now we think, 300,000 to 200,000 years ago. And they, it's a, they sort of appear throughout Africa. It's, it's a, there isn't a single pinpoint cradle of humanity, but humans emerged in Africa. And around anything between 100,000 and 50,000 years ago, they started leaving Africa, right? A small set of, of our ancestors decided to see what, what else was out there. So we've got humans in the Middle East, in the Levant, in the Arabian Peninsula, between yeah, 100,000 to 90,000 years ago. Some of these individuals, some of these first waves, second wave of expansion went extinct, as far as we can tell, had no descendants alive today. Others were more successful. We also had people rich in Europe around 40,000 years ago, they got wiped out. We had 
they got wiped out by the next set of Europe, people who reached Europe 20,000 years ago, who also got wiped out. Europe has actually been a constant source of population replacements. But what's important for our purposes today is that we've got people leaving Africa, again, between 150,000 years ago and reaching this part of the world, South Asia, mainland South Asia, Ireland, South Asia, uh, and Australia, at the very least 50,000 years ago, probably earlier, probably 60,000 years ago, right? So who are these people? And again, let's get a better map. Let's get a zoom in here of the places we're talking about. So when we talk about Island Southeast Asia, I do mean primarily Indonesia, the Philippines, I mean Brunei, I mean Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste. I do not mean peninsular or mainland East Asia, and I do not mean Australia, although as you'll see in a second, there is some relevance to Australia. But we're really talking about this part of the world here, right? And so this part of the world, I've told you, was settled 60,000-ish years ago, and it was settled by people who came this way, who came down mainland East Asia, came down Peninsular Malaysia, and the sea levels were different, so the geography doesn't quite line up, but they expanded, they kept going east, 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 until reaching what today we would call Papua New Guinea. And Papua New Guinea, they split into two. One of them doubled back up into the Papua New Guinea highlands, and the other became the ancestors of of indigenous Australians, of present day indigenous Australians, right? So these people arrived in this region 60,000 years ago. And I can say that because the oldest human fossils, at least 60,000, because the oldest recognizably human fossils we find in Australia are 60,000 years old, more or less. And we know they came this way. And so, and they stayed here. These people are, we would call them today, especially in Indonesia, we call them genetically Papuan, but I don't know, obviously we have no idea what they call themselves, right? But they stayed here. They were very successful at settling here. They were very successful living here. They were so successful in fact that they stuck around and were the only people here until around three to 4,000 years ago where we get a second wave of migration. And these are the Austroasiatic people. These are people that come down from Taiwan, present day Taiwan. They are very, very skilled navigators and seafarers. There is this 4,000 years ago where they are able to set up to colonize the Philippines, islands like Sulawesi, Sumatra, Java, etc. And they come down again from Taiwan, down, 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 down. And when they reach sort of the, the southernmost end of the Indonesian archipelago, some of them go east and some of them go west. But they are differentially successful at going east and at going west. They do a lot better when they go west into almost back into peninsular mainland Asia then they are going east. And so what happens today when you look at Indonesia and you look at the genetics of Indonesian populations is it kind of looks something like this. In the western half of the country, you have people who genetically are not making any claims at all about cultural affiliations or linguistic affiliation, but genetically they are fairly Austroasiatic. They are descendant from these migrants that came down from Taiwan. And as you go east, 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 east into present day Papua New Guinea, you find that the genetic contribution of these Austroasiatic individuals diminishes dramatically to the point where you don't see any in Papua New Guinea, in New Guinea Island, whether it be the Papua New Guinea or the Indonesian side of New Guinea Island. There is no, there is no Austroasiatic genetic ancestry in the people who live here today. These people really seem to have been here for 60,000 years uninterrupted. And again, this is not a claim of cultural continuity necessarily, it might be for some of the groups, so some of the groups might not disagree, some people might have gone extinct, but genetically they have been there for 60,000 years. There is very little disputing this fact, right? And so we've got again this, what we call a climb, where we go from the west, fully Austroasiatic, to the east, fully Papuan, and in the middle we get a mixture of the two, right? So I told you I wasn't going to talk about Flores or Luzonensis, and the reason I didn't want to talk about them is that I don't have any DNA information about them. So as fascinating as they are, as interesting as they are, they don't, because I work on DNA, they don't contribute much to my knowledge, right? But I do want to talk about another, another extinct hominin, and it's this one, Homo denisovans. Now, what you're seeing here, look at the scale bar, it's really small. It is in fact the smallest finger bone from the smallest finger of a young girl, maybe 10 years old, who died in a cave in Siberia. Huh? 50,000 years ago, Siberia, right? Um, so this girl was a Denisovan, she was, in, she was in the middle. And so, although I have no idea what she looked like because this is the biggest bone we have from this girl, we do have her complete genome sequence. 
from this bone, from the holes here that you see, we have managed to extract enough DNA to sequence this girl's genome. And that lets me know a lot of things about her that are actually fascinating to me as, as, a, study, as, a, as a student really of human evolution, right? So one thing I can do is I can update sort of the most rudimentary human family tree from that single genome sequence and, and the equivalent sequence that was generated from a Neanderthal fossil. I can tell you that Denisovans and Neanderthals and Homo sapiens today are three very closely related population groups. So the point that we could argue here forever if these are three different species or if they're three different subpopulations of the same species, and I will save that controversy for later. I'm just gonna say Homo sapiens, Denisovans, Neanderthals, and again, avoid that question. But these three groups last had a common ancestor around 700,000 years ago, which might seem like a long time, but you know, in evolutionary time is really not that long ago at all. From that single genome sequence of this Denisovan girl, and again, comparing to Neanderthals, I can tell you that the two of them last shared an ancestor 300,000 years ago, right? And earlier I told you that humans appeared in Africa around 300 years and years ago. So now we have some dates on our tree. It's a very straightforward relationship between these three populations. And down here, what I've shown is population movements, expansions of humans out of Africa as the number of us sort of grows and grows and grows, which again take place between 150,000 years ago. The one thing that's missing from this figure and the one thing that was really fascinating from sequencing, like the best sort of piece of knowledge that came out of sequencing the Denisovan genome and the Neanderthal genome was this idea. So these little arrows suggest that as humans, well, they're shorthand really for the fact that as humans expanded out of Africa into the Levant, into the Middle East and into Europe, they found someone there and that someone was Neanderthals. So they did what you know, you might expect to happen, they had babies together. And so there is Neanderthal DNA in the genome of every single individual alive today of non-African descent. And then, okay, that happened. That happened fairly early on because again, it's shared across all of humanity except individuals of African descent. So it must have happened fairly early in our expansion out of Africa. But then as humans kept going east, and they crossed the Himalayas, they crossed the Caucasus, they sort of started expanding throughout East Asia, they bumped into the Nisovans, and they also had babies together, right? So not only do we find that all individuals alive today of non-African descent have one to 2% of Neanderthal DNA in their genomes, some individuals in the world have up to 5% of the Nisovan genome. And these individuals are not randomly scattered throughout the planet. Like it's not me and like somebody else randomly here. It's really geographically restricted. And where is it geographically restricted to? Of course, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about this region. Island Southeast Asia. So the Papuan individuals that live in Island Southeast Asia today, these genetically Papuan individuals that live in Island Southeast Asia today have up to 5% of the Nisovan DNA in their genomes above and beyond that one to 2% of Neanderthal DNA that we all have. In mainland East Asia, so in Han Chinese individuals and Cambodians and Vietnamese, we find much lower percentages of the Nisovan DNA, but we do find some, we find between 0.1 and 1% of the genome, but it really peaks around here, right? And it also is found in present day indigenous Australians. And so, that's a, it's a cute fact, right? It's an interesting fact, actually. It's really, it's fascinating. It tells us a lot about dynamics of populations and movements, and, and there is a lot of further detail that can be gleaned from that. But I think sort of the first question that you might have is, what does that mean? Like, what does that do for you? What, what does having one to 2% Neanderthal DNA mean for me, for you, for my neighbors, for my family? What does 5% of Denisovan DNA mean, right? And so let's take that question in, in two parts. Let's look at the Neanderthal DNA today. So if we look at, Neanderthal DNA amongst all humans today, we find that those bits of the genome that are Neanderthal that are found in present day individuals contribute to their hair color. So some Neanderthals were red hair, some of us owe or red hair in part to Neanderthals. It also contributes to some variation in skin color, both lighter and darker shades. It contributes also to some benefits to our immune system. It also contributes to our body weight. In some ways, it seems some Neanderthal variants that are found, so you remember those variants that I was drawing on the lines, some of them contribute to body weight, so to higher BMI, contributes to your risk of depression, to mood disorders, to lupus, your risk of getting lupus, 
to your risk of heart disease, to your risk of blood clotting disorders. It sounds pretty grim, right? It all sounds pretty grim, but it's worth keeping in mind one thing. And that's the fact that the environment in which we live today, in which these variants contribute to the risk of depression of mood disorders, has nothing to do with the environment in which the Neanderthals were living, right? So for instance, a genetic variant that increases your ability to store fat, body weight, is a lot more useful 50,000 years ago when you know lean times are really, really lean than it is today when I have spent the last year of my life sitting at home and doing nothing. It's really come back to haunt me that Neanderthal variant. Whereas 50,000 years ago when I was hunting and, and you know we had periods of very significant famine, it was pretty useful to be able to store fat. So these are the sort of things that Neanderthal DNA contributes to. What about Denisovan DNA? What does it contribute to? And the answer to that is we don't know yet. And I'll tell you at the end why we don't know, but I'm also gonna tell you now. So all of what I've described so far has been sort of collective work in the past 10 years in the field of human genetics. It's not, I haven't touched on anything that I've done so far, but now I'm gonna change and I'm gonna tell you what we're trying to do in my lab to understand these contributions of Denisov and DNA, right? Oops, sorry, wrong way. How do we, so how do we do it? Well, I told you that we have the Denisovan genome and I'm gonna draw it in yellow throughout the talk because I like yellow. Um, and so I'm gonna take that Denisovan genome and I'm gonna line it up against a bunch of genomes from a bunch of other humans. And I'm gonna do this humans that have some Denisovan DNA, right? So these are genomes from individuals from Papua New Guinea and Indonesia who carry some Denisovan DNA. And I'm gonna go through those variants that I told you earlier and annotate the ones that are Denisovan in origin. So I'm gonna make them yellow. So in this bit of genome, you can see some individuals are variable from the reference genome in some ways or in other positions. And some of those variants are of Denisovan origin. And I'm, let, I'm, I'm setting aside how exactly we do this assignment. It actually is computationally nightmare, but it, we're very confident in saying these three individuals, this yellow variant here, they got it from a Denisovan ancestor. But this one here is not. This one here comes from modern humans, right? And so I'm just gonna go through the genome and make a catalog of Denisovan variants that are found today in the people of Papua New Guinea. And I'm gonna leave the question of what I do with them hanging for a second and return to my other question that I posed earlier, which was how do my cells know what to become? Which I know feels like a bit of a jarring sort of topic switch, but hopefully you'll see in a second how it comes together, right? So when I, when I asked this question, I said, well, DNA, something, something, DNA, it's in the nucleus and it looks like this. And, uh, and it was a total lie. It does not look like this. It looks more like this. And it literally is coiled. So this is the same genome sequence as, as the one that I've crossed out here, but I've coiled it up a little bit here. I've drawn these little coils around it. And it, again, it literally is Coil. What I'm not showing you here is at every single one of these loops, there is a little protein that holds the loop together. Um, but it's, it is, if you remember those old telephone wires, you could stretch them, you could not stretch them, it's linky. It looks like that. And you'll notice there is two possible sort of configurations. There is this one where the loops are fairly spaced out and there are some genes in this region. And there is this one where the loops are very close together and there is other genes in this region, right? And what this means, this might seem like arbitrary, but it's not arbitrary in the slightest. What this looks like to your genome and to your cell is like this. The bits that are open are on, and, the, and we call them open. And the bits that are closed, the bits that are you know, tightly coiled together, they are off. So whatever this cell is, it's making this set of proteins, but it's not making this set of proteins here. And I'm setting aside the question of how this sort of set of how each cell knows what to coil, what to open, that we could be here for another three hours. It's actually a favorite topic of mine, but um, we don't have time to cover it today. But what I want you to keep in mind is that the genome is not linear. The genome is not simply shoved into the nucleus haphazardly, like I hinted at earlier, but rather that it's really, really structured, that there is this sort of 3D structure to your genome where some of it is visible to a given cell and some of it is invisible to that cell because it's tightly packed, such that although each cell contains the same genome, they don't all see the same information, right? And so if we think of two types of cells, we've got a muscle cell and it really looks like that. It's elongated, it squishes when it's contracting, it stretches open when it's stretching. 
and we've got an immune cell. And again, it really looks kind of like that. It's blurby. And if we look inside of them, we'll find that the muscle cell expresses, has some proteins, and the immune cell has a different set of proteins, right? And if we look at the genomes inside the nucleus of the muscle cell and the nucleus cell, then we'll find something like this. In the muscle cell, the purple gene and the gray gene and the dark blue gene and the yellow gene are open, they are stretched out, they are visible to the cell, and so we get those proteins here. And in the immune cell, I'm sure you can guess, the genome again is the same, it's the same genes in the same order, but the configuration, the shape of it is different. And so here, the light green gene and the light blue gene and the yellow gene and the reddish pinkish gene are visible, are on, but these are off. And so these are the proteins that we find inside this cell, right? And so this is how tissue specificity, what we call tissue specificity, which is again, the muscle cell is different from the immune cell, is different from the eye cell, is accomplished by controlling the complement of genes that is turned on in the cell at any given time. And so one thing we can do then is combine the two parts of the stock together, this bit about the structure of the genome inside a cell, and the bit about those Denisovan variants invariants that are scattered also throughout the genome, right? So we can ask a really simple question. We can say, hey, I have all of these Denisovan variants variants throughout the genome. In, where do they fall in the genome? And in the regions of the genome that they fall, what shape is that in a muscle cell? And so here, if you count, you will find that there is one, two, and three Denisovan variants variants in the on regions of the genome. And there is 13, you can count them yourself, region, Denisovan variants in the off regions of the genome, right? So this individual has 16 variants, 13 of which its muscle cells could not care less about. What does it look like in the immune cells? Same variants, same genome, but because the genome is folded differently, very different count. Now we see that eight out of the 16 Denisovan variants are in on regions and eight out of the 16 Denisovan variants are in the off regions. And so I can, this is, I'm just counting right now, right? Like it's not a really intellectually complex, I hope. It's just, we're going through, we are counting, this many on, this many off, next cell type, right? So I can do this for a bunch of different cell types and I can calculate what excess of mutations I have in the on region of the genome doing some statistics, which again, no need to go into right now, but I can look at one kind of lung cells and say, okay, as many as I would expect to see in the on regions. Another kind of lung cell, uh, slight excess, okay. Neurons, slight deficit of Denisovan variants in the on regions. Other kind of neuron, another deficit, so on and so forth. I can do this for hundreds of cell types, right? And what I find is that the only place where I find a systematic excess of on, of, of Denisovan variants in the on bits of the genomes are the immune cells. Everything else is kind of just like I would expect, nothing exciting about it. But there are more Denisovan variants on, sorry, in the on regions of the genomes in immune cells that you would expect by chance. And that's kind of interesting in and of itself, but it's even more interesting because we don't see that trend with Neanderthals. We only see it with Denisovans, right? And the reason it's interesting is that although the Denisovan genome that I have comes from Siberia, there is starting to be evidence that there were Denisovan individuals themselves down in Southeast Asia, that some of the people that, that as we expanded as a species into Southeast Asia, we met them there. And that matters because if they were there, so were their pathogens. They were used to dealing with the tropical pathogens that have always existed in the tropics, right? And so the hypothesis here goes that Denisovans interbreeding with Denisovans when humans got there, helped them adapt to the tropical landscape to which the Denisovans were already used. Because as, as we move into, as we encounter, as, as we have painfully seen, of course, as we encounter a novel pathogen that tends to challenge our immune system quite a bit. But if you're habituated to it, it's easier to deal with it. And so the bits of DNA that were most advantageous for those early humans arriving into the Papua New Guinea, into Indonesia, into the archipelago, were the bits that allowed them to survive there. And immunity is a law, is a huge part of surviving. Surviving pathogens is a huge part of successfully settling, right? Okay, cool. Now, there is one thing though that I have done and you might have noticed, you might not have noticed, that's fine, is that I have kept my language very careful. 
on purpose. I haven't said that these Denisovan variants cause anything. I've simply said that it looks like they could cause it, that they are associated, right? And this again, this was on purpose because actually predicting, although I can count these variants and say, well, they are visible to the cell, it's really hard to say what they actually do for the cell, right? So let me illustrate that by showing you a little cartoon. Here again is our, our toy example of a gene, this time it's gray. So if a Denisovan variant falls into the DNA sequence, then you can easily predict what's going to happen. You can say, well, it's gonna be in the RNA and it's going to impact then the final protein in, in some way or another, right? This mutation will maybe alter the shape of this protein such that it now doesn't work as well or it works better. We can, it's even this is kind of hard to predict, but at least the logic here is perhaps easier to follow because what happens if it falls there, which most of the time, this is what the data looks like. You've got a gene and near it, you've got a variant and you say, I don't know what it does. I have no idea what this thing does because it's not in a gene. So it's hard to predict what it does, right? And so this part of the genome here that contains no gene, you might have heard it referred to as junk DNA. It is not junk DNA. Please, if you remember nothing else from the stock, this is not junk DNA. This is, I would say, the fun part of your genome. And the reason it's the fun part of your genome is that this is the bit of your genome that controls when and where and how much of this gene is made into RNA, is made into protein. If you take this bit out, you lose the ability to control when and where you turn off a gene, right? So if this mutation falls here, one thing it can do is maybe you can say, oh, well, we're gonna make more protein. We're gonna make less protein perhaps, or maybe we will simply just not make any protein at all. We're not gonna change the gene. The gene would work fine if you could turn it on, but somehow you've broken the switch that turns it on. So this is, these are, this is what's known as gene regulation because you regulate, you control, again, how much, when, how, for how long. <clears throat> and these are the parts of the genome. This, this is what makes up the bulk of your genome. And so in order to really understand what these Denisovan the variants do, then we have done this computational side of the analysis, but we have also worked with very wonderful Indonesian colleagues across three islands in the archipelago, so Mentawai, Sumba, and the Kodawai, who are, who are not an island, they're a community that lives in, in Papua. Um, and so what we have done is we have measured, and well, you will notice that they span that climb, that sort of range of ancestry from fully Austroasiatic in Mentawai to fully Papuan in the Kodawai and the Sumbanese somewhere in between. What we have done is we have gone to these populations or our Indonesian colleagues have gone to these populations and collected blood. And in that blood, we have measured the levels of RNA of these individuals, right? So from DNA, we get RNA. And what we have also done is we have sequenced their genomes. So now I've sequenced their genomes. I can compare their genomes to the Denisovan variants that I found by looking simply at the genome sequence. And I can start to really put together these two halves of my study, but I can also start sort of to put together the two halves of this talk, right, where we have these variants of Denisovan origin, we don't know what they do. We have some theories about what they do. They're pretty educated guesses, but it's only now that we actually have the experimental data, which comes from measuring the RNA, the actual consequence of these variants in like the, the direct impact on gene expression, that we can really start sort of piecing together the meaning of, of all of these variants and what they mean for, for all of humanity, right? And so I'm going to leave it there to leave some time for discussion. I just want to acknowledge that this work is actually the bit of the work that I've done is actually very collaborative and it could be, it would be impossible to do it with, without lots of people, but especially people at the, our collaborators at the Eichmann Institute in, in Jakarta, including Hera Sudoyo, who's sort of instrumental to setting up the, uh, the entire Eichmann and, and Chelsea and Pi, who have been phenomenal collaborators. And with that, I'm really happy to talk about what I've talked about now or broader questions sort of about DNA and humans and the intersection of the two. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irene. It's certainly given us a lot to talk, to think about. Um, however, perhaps while you catch your breath, hmm. we might give you two or three minutes and uh, I'll just um, talk about the lecture for next month uh, and ask other people who know about meetings that the group may like to hear about uh, if they will sort of unmute and uh, 
and give us the details of those as well. Um, in a month's time, on Thursday the 25th of March at 7.30, and apologies once again for the people who um, responded to the seven o'clock start. Uh, it was confusing and, uh, and, a, and a, a kind of error that I take responsibility for and, uh, and say, well, I, I understand how it happened and I hope it won't happen again. So anyhow, next, next month, we are going to have a talk from Uncle Graham Atkinson, uh, who is a, a traditional owner, elder and leader of the Jaya Warung people. Uh, he's also uh, trained in social work and has an arts degree, and he sits on the Justice Commission for Victoria and uh, in parks uh, on the, uh, on the uh, Commission for Parks Victoria. He has broad ranging um, uh, involvement, but he has been uh, very active in terms of the struggle for land justice in Victoria. And he's agreed to come and talk to us about that. Uh, and I think it will be a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting talk. So um, if you would like to put that in your diaries and we'll remind you closer to the time how to do it, it will be a Zoom meeting once again. So um, that's what's going to happen uh, in four weeks time. Uh, Les, do you have any meetings that you want to alert us to? Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Uh, there's a couple. The next meeting of the Ex-Religious Support Network is going to be on Saturday morning, the 13th of March. Uh, so have a look on Meetup or on Facebook and do a search on Ex-Religious Support Network. And the next meeting of the Philosophy Matters group is going to be on the 30th of March, Tuesday, the 30th of March. And for that one, I'll be speaking on The Good Life, A Humanist View. And that one will start at 6.30 p.m. Now, both of those meetings will be on Zoom. For the Philosophy Matters, once again, get onto Facebook or onto Meetup um, and do a search on Philosophy Matters, or even easier, get onto the humanist website and look in the events section because they're all listed there. Great. So, thanks, Jenny. Okay. Thank you. So over to you, Paul. Um, how are we going in the chat and questions? Good evening, everybody. Just before we move to that, among the guests we like, we hope to have with us on these public programs, are people like the deaf disruptors who do a different kind of Last hurrah funeral, that will be interesting. We're aware of asylum seeker issues that will become important at a certain time of the year. There's the question of housing for people who are lacking housing and a lot of other issues provided by interesting people. So with all the changes, we're gradually building this program. Thank you for that. Now, coming to the comments from people, everybody can see in the chat uh, a couple of things that have been put. Now, Michael put one, but could I go first, Jenny, to yours, since it related directly to things we've heard tonight. And uh, that is about adaptation to climate change. Now, I think actually the address, Irene went on to reference that a little bit after you put your question up. Would you like to speak to it first, Jenny, briefly? Uh, no, it, it, Irene did did cover it, uh, and uh, um, I thought I'll just sort of throw it into the mix. It's a bit of a wild question because, uh, okay. I mean, we know that a lot of migration occurred on account of climate change uh, over the epochs, but... Um, I was wondering if there's so far much evidence coming through in the genomic uh, patterning to allow us to say anything else about uh, how climate change may have um, wrought changes. But yeah, no, so it is actually a, a good question. I mean, it's it's hard to answer that question, though, to be fair, mm -hmm. especially with regards to the needs of them. So we have 
three genomes. No, sorry, we have one full genome in the Siberian one, and then we have two low quality genomes from also from Siberia, from the same cave. Um, and so, and they're very close in time, right? So they're all from 50,000 years ago. So they encounter a similar climate. They far predate the most recent ice age. Um, so it's kind of hard to get an idea there of, of adaptations in that sense. Um, so I can, I mean, it also, Neander, the argument, one of the arguments goes that Neanderthals were more adapted to cold and when the world thawed before the last age, they dealt poorly. That doesn't, it's one of many theories as to why they went extinct. It's not particularly well supported, I would say. Um, there is some evidence of some adaptations to some cold things. So for instance, just better tolerance of cold in some individuals, but it's not very widespread. It's very, so I mean, Neanderthals and the Nisimans and humans all contain a fair range of genetic variations. So some Neanderthals might have been better at dealing with cold than others, but there isn't, the, I think the strongest signal we have seen or, or of the, the, ah, sorry, the beneficial gene flow, the benefits of gene flow have consistently been on immunity. Um, and so we find that in Neanderthal DNA in Europeans, and we're starting to see it in Denisovan DNA in people who carry Denisovan DNA. And the reason I say we find it in, in Europeans primarily is something that I, I, I cut out of my talk because I didn't have time, but if I have a second, I would actually like to pose a question to the floor, which is, let me find my screen sharing option. Uh, da -da 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 -da. So um, a, one of the ways we learn about what genomes do is something called GWAS. Don't worry too much about what it stands for. Um, but it's, um, it's a type of study where we look at genetic variants and we say, OK, some people are tall. Can we find a DNA variant in common, right? So here is the oh, spoilers. Here is the number of individuals in GWAS collectively in 2018. And I'm just wondering if people have guesses as to which of the, col what color, so each of these colors represents a continental population or an ethnicity. And I'm just wondering if people have any ideas as to what each of the colors may be, or chiefly what the red color may be, who, who they are. And I'm, I'm, unmute yourself and just shout it out. Would it be Africa? That's a good, that's a, that's a very charitable thought. Any other takers? If it's a scientific study, I assume it's either North America or Western Europe. Yeah, it's Europeans. So here is for comparison. So this is the people we're studying. Here is their contribution to the global population. You will notice the brutal, brutal disparity. And so we know a lot more about Neanderthal contributions to individuals today about Neanderthals because we have sequenced a lot of Europeans, we have the genome sequence of a lot of Europeans who carry Neanderthal DNA, but not Denisovan DNA. So we know very little about Denisovans because we only study Europeans, which is a, sort of a strange sentence. But I think it also speaks to another question in the chat, actually. So I'm going to jump ahead and, and sort of scoop the moderator here. Somebody else was asking if we could clone uh, a Denisovan from the genome. And uh, the answer is no on, on a multiple levels. One of them is that even if I were to sequence every single PAF1 individual, you wouldn't recover the whole genome of the Nisa Um, You would recover the chunks that were advantageous and have remained either advantageous or not particularly problematic to this point in time. So you can actually recover around 40% of the Denisovan genome from the global population today, and you can recover an equivalent percent of the Europe of the Neanderthal genome from again all the individuals alive today that carry that DNA. The 60% that's missing, we presume, was either just straight, some of it might have been lost by chance, but some of it must have been straight up not beneficial to the individuals who carried it, right? Um, so we have outside of what we find in people today, like if we sequence fossils, we find Yes, we find genomes, but they are not sort of high enough. They're high quality and, and they're good. They're not complete. There is maybe like, not, there is maybe 10% of the genome missing and that's a technological problem. But the other problem is that to make a Denisovan, you would have to take a fertilized or a human individual, a human donor, right? You'd have to take sperm and an egg and Denisovanize these. And the technology is simply not there. We would have to, 
edit the genome of this individual, not at one place, not at two places, which is what we talk about when we think about curing diseases, like genetically curing diseases, but you'd have to change millions of positions in the genome of that unborn individual. And it's just, it's technologically absolutely unfeasible. And I think it will remain so for quite. So Irene, can I um, help us move through a few questions? Yeah, yeah of course, yeah. You, you have so much you can share with us. And um, you may find as the different questions come up. That's all right. If you can cover different parts of that. Um, so I think I should honor Michael, who was first up. Michael, do you want to speak your question about the magnetic core reversal? Uh, yeah, look, I, I, I mean, yeah, from reading and learning a bit over the last um, little while, um, there seems to have been some identification of a magnetic reversal event around about 42,000 years ago, uh, which was seen to be a fairly significant event on the planet. And it seems to coincide approximately with when both Denisovans and Neanderthals, or around about that time, became extinct. And I'm just wondering whether there's any evidence yeah. to link between the two. I, I saw that headlines too. So I have to confess, I haven't read the, the, the magnetic core paper. I'm not an expert in that, but I do know that um, there is evidence for both Neanderthals and the Nisovans after that time. So the Nisovans, especially in Southeast Asia, might have been around to 30,000. So in, in Indonesia, et cetera, might have been around to 30,000 um, years ago. And Neanderthals, I think one of the problems we have is that until very recently, archaeologists used to think that Neanderthals were dumb and stupid and incapable of technological complexity. And so when you found a cave in Europe with a really complex tool and it was 30,000 years old, you were like, clearly that was made by humans because Neanderthals were stupid. Um, we have reassessed our understanding of Neanderthals. We realize now that they were complex individuals. They had complex, so they had what we would call them, oh my God, complex beliefs. So they seem to have symbolic belief. They seem to have had jewelry. They seem to have had religion. And so, and there is a, currently a lot of sort of re-examining of the fossil record. I mean, like, actually, this could have been Neanderthals that made this tool and that tool that is more recent than 42,000. Um, definitely my understanding of the magnetic core flip is that it is, it is a big thing. Um, but on the other hand, if it happens, I think it happens, sometimes well, people don't even know how fast it happens, right? Like it just seems to happen and mm -hmm. we know very little about it. It's hard to predict. Um, so I don't know what it could have done, but I do know that there is evidence for both species persisting longer than, more recently than that. Okay. That's my answer. So then we have the question about the place of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. The origin of the southward movement. I'm assuming, Irene, that you're seeing these questions. Um, I, I closed the chat again so I could see your faces, but I can look at it again. Yes. What's the significance of Taiwan as the origin of the southward movement of the Venezuelans? Is um, this what, is this what you, you've shared? Only you have that one, but I can, I mean, so they, they're, these are people who simply came down from Taiwan. They were skilled navigators. I don't think there is any specific significant, I mean, I guess in a really blasé way, Taiwan was there and they came They came down from somewhere. Um, I'm not quite certain how, how else to answer the question in the sense that these are people who, they were mainland Asia. My, my, I confess my genetic knowledge of the, the deep history of mainland Asia is a bit spotty, but they would have been from, you know, I don't even know if, I don't I actually don't want to say too much. Um, there are mainland Asian individuals who were living in Taiwan and then they were seafarers, they spread down and they keep spreading actually, they go all the way to, you know, they, these are the people who eventually settled the, the far Pacific Islands. Um, but yeah, why, the, why Taiwan? Why not Taiwan, I guess? It was the first island they found when they left mainland Asia and they settled there and they refined their craft, I guess. It seems okay. like the islands as distinct from the continents have quite a different place in the stream of development for, they, for quite particular reasons, I would say. Well, they call for different subsistence strategies, right? I mean, the first thing you need to do is you need to be able to sail to the island. And uh, if you're in the mainland, then you, you generally just, depending on where you are, of course, but it, it's, it's easier to, to expand than it is to sail to cross a, a boundary, a, a water barrier, a water body. So in that sense, it requires technological development, but beyond that again, I don't know, I don't know what else I would say. I would say these people were 
extremely skilled navigators. And even the people who, the first wave of migrants were also very skilled, must have been very skilled navigators because there were bodies of water and they were, they were crossing a hundred miles of water. So even 40,000 years ago, there was, a, you know, we had the technology to cross. And so these people really were fantastic navigators. Um, the technology, their tools haven't survived, but, but they had them, they must have had them. Their, their wooden boats haven't survived. It's hard to find a 40,000 year old wooden boat in the Pacific. But, but they had them. And what is your cat's name? Uh, this is Malbec, and then you missed Pinot Noir. Uh, okay, <laughs> now folks, you are able to put other questions or ask to deliver one orally as Les has done. Other than that, I don't see any more in the list myself. Les, what would you, unmute please, and what would you like to ask? Uh, thanks, Paul, and thanks for an absolutely fascinating discussion uh, yeah. talk. Irene. Um, one thing I really have a hard time getting my head around is how you ascertain, um, for example, that one, you know, around 1% 1 or so of the current human population is Den Denis, say, for example, Des Denisovan genes. And the, what, what I don't understand is that for any particular gene, there are lots and lots of variations among the current yeah. human population but with denisovans we might only have five or 50 samples so with such an incredibly incredibly small sample size how can we make statistical comparisons that's a, that's a fantastic question and i'm going to try to keep the answer as simple as i can so it might go into a bit into statistical weeds um, but the idea is we can only do this now because we have sequenced First of all, a lot of human genomes, so I can get an idea of what is what I can find in the human population in general. Different, um, and we have sequenced a lot of African genomes also. So Africa is what our African individuals contain more genetic diversity than anyone else um, as a, as a whole, right? So the subset of individuals who left Africa to colonize the rest of the of the world carried only a subset of all African variations. So we have a pretty good idea of the variation that exists in human populations. And one thing we can do is then we can kind of, sort of like those trees that I showed you earlier where I can just build the relationships between them. I can say, these two sequences are pretty similar. They, they differ here. Um, that sequence differs somewhere else. Actually, let me, let me pull up a figure and I think that might be more helpful. My big, stop. Ah, yeah, he, it's, it's dinner time, sorry. Um, so let me go back and share in a second, okay. Where is this thing? Here, okay, so let me share again. Right, so the reason I made this assignment is to, well, I have sequenced a lot of human genomes, and I have sequenced one Denisovan genome. Yes, absolutely only one. But I understand I can build relationships between these genomes. And so for instance, if you look across a single one of these genomes, you will find that this individual here, number five, is genetically very similar to number three, number two, and number one, right? They differ only in this place here and in the Denisovan one. And how can I say that one is Denisovan, but this one isn't? The reason I can say it is that I never see, I see this, this variant in the, Denis, in the Denisovan genome, and I never see it in individuals who shouldn't have Denisovan ancestry. I never see it in Europeans, for example, right? And the other thing that's worth keeping in mind is that I have simplified this cartoon a lot. So this looks like it's a single position in the genome. It's actually a stretch of maybe 10,000 base pairs, right? So it's a stretch of sequence where I only see that particular stretch, those 10,000 base pairs with the variant here and here and here and here. I see that configuration of variants only in the Denisovan genome. I don't see ever that configuration of variants anywhere else. And so then when I see it in a normal, in a, in a human, I can then say, ah, if I only see this in individuals who I know have Denisovan ancestry and in the Denisovan genome, then it's probably Denisovan. If I were to find that also in Africans, I would say, well, I know Africans don't have Denisovan DNA, so then this cannot be Denisovan by inference. It must have a different origin. And that's kind of the simplest way to answer your question. A lot of it is probabilistic assignment when you say, well, the odds of this not being Denisovan are pretty low, so we are going to say 
we're going to set a threshold and hard call that and anything above it as the needs of them. But the logic is very much simply we compare it to the genome. If we only see it in people who should have it and um, the needs of them, then we say it's the needs of them, I guess is the, the simple answer. Uh, thanks, Irene. Terrific. Now, it can be open for anyone for a minute or two. Irene, if you are happy, um, we don't really set a finish time, but of course 8.30 is one marker which we've passed, and probably 8.45 is perhaps the other one, so five is good. That's fine. No, I'm whatever good. inspiration people have to comment or share your thoughts or appreciations, over to you. Um, Paul, can I, I've got a question for I ask, please. Yes, who is it? This is Philip Crone. Good, thank you, Philip. Um, yeah, thanks, Irene, for a fascinating, thought-provoking talk. I'm fascinated by this sort of Denisovans and where they came from, where they've gone. So two questions I'll ask successively. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, you showed on your map how the Denisovans came south into Southeast Asia and then some of them turned left and headed eastward through Melanesia. Mm -hmm. Did they... And then you said something about colonising the Pacific. So did they, so question one is, did those Denisovans eventually become Polynesians and are Polynesians more or less Denisovan? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, as far as I know, my ancestry is 100% European. So should I assume that I contain no Denisovan DNA? Okay, let's go, let's answer the, the, the second one first. Yes, assume that. It's a very safe assumption to make. You, you have Neanderthal DNA. Um, if you have Denisovan DNA, I would be extremely surprised to hear this. Um, now, the first question, who, who are the blue people? Um, so I, I'm sorry if I misspoke or if it was, it was complicated. These are Austroasiatics. They're not Denisovans. Um, so these people are Austroasiatic instead. And so they're coming down and they're spending Denisovans at 3,000 years ago, which is when the, the blue individuals come down, the Nisa ones are long, long gone, long dead and gone. Um, but these people do indeed, they actually never settle into New Guinea Island, but they do settle into Bougainville, into uh, Solomon Islands, etc. And they keep expanding east and east and east. And they do settle, they do become Polynesians. They seem to be the ancestors of Polynesians, which is really why I can confidently say that they were phenomenal seafarers because colonizing this, when you have a wooden boat, takes an extreme amount of skill, right? Um, so yes, the Austroasiatic and the Polynesian peoples are very closely linked to each other. Um, but Austroasiatic individuals actually do not con do not carry the Nisivan DNA. It's really only that first wave of migrants that we say here, that the red line that gets sort of overwritten by the second Austroasiatic migration wave of migrants, much more recent wave, that contains the Denisovan DNA. Mm -hmm. That's the error. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. And Les Allen has another question. Thank you, Les. Um, thanks for indulging me. Um, on junk DNA, I, Irene, mm -hmm. um, as you intimated, we, uh, geneticists have changed their minds a lot on junk DNA. I was wondering whether you were talking about how some of the junk DNA, what was considered junk DNA, is uh, regulated genes. Is that the thinking for all of the junk DNA? these days? Great question. Um, depends on who you ask. Uh, it, this is a topic, a contentious topic. Some people might say that, so there is a paper out there, a very big paper with a claim that 80% of the genome has a function. And some people laugh at that and think that's ridiculous and, and, and ludicrous. I can tell you that the, when I think about regulatory DNA, I think about the bits that turn things on and off that have a, a clear function. Um, those are not all of the genome. There are a lot of your genome, a lot of the human genome and, and mammalian genomes contain what are known as repeats. And so these are sequences of DNA that can be like thousands and thousands of base pairs long that consist of the letter like A, 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 T, G, C, A, T, T, over and over and over again. And the shorter and longer elements, some of them are, are viral in origin. Um, some of these, whether these are functional is again, uh, a contentious topic. Some of them are functional, some of them the, that are sort of the birthing ground for new genes, some of them are, are argued to be functional, not in the sense that you need that particular sequence there, but rather that you need 
that se any sequence there to maintain the shape of the genome, to give it structure, to make it robust. And so it really depends on your definition of function. What I think we have really moved away from, and then what I think is important, is really considering that anything that doesn't make a protein is nonsense. That has been abandoned, and now we're really quibbling as to where do we draw the function line? What does function mean? And if it had a function, you know, 300,000 years ago, but it has lost it because the gene is broken, what is it? Is that, you know, do we count it in the functional side or do we not count it in the functional side? The genome is not a static thing. It's constantly turning over and changing. And so what is function is, is again, uh, a long talk. Um, but yeah, I think depends on your definition is the short answer. The, I would lean towards it's some of it must be there for a reason. Yeah. Hey, thank yeah you. Thanks, Ari. Um, friends, I myself have been called away to something. Jenny, would you like to take another question from Michael? Yes, and indeed. Then, um, we've had a great evening. Thank you, Irene. And I will leave it for Jenny for you to okay. carry through. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Michael, you had a question? Yeah, look, it's, it's an observation, I think, just to confirm my understanding. I, I think what I understand is that there is no evidence of Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA in Africa, if I've got that right. And um, But I, I think I picked up somewhere along the line that within Indigenous Australian populations, the proportion of DNA uh, that can be identified as Denisovan is as high as, you know, four to six percent. Um, would that be about right? Absolutely correct. And that's, yeah. it's the same wave of individuals. It's, it's that first wave at red line. When they get to... Which, which, yeah, sorry, yeah. which just makes, which gen genetically, it makes them very different, of course, to us, uh, us, us invaders. <laughs> I, mean, I think we can, we, can, we can argue that, right? Because ultimately, it's, yes, they are carrying these variants. But on the other hand, if you compare, and, you know, they look very exotic and very distant because, oh, they have a, a source that we know and, and it's, it's a different source, it's a strange source. But if you compare the genomes of like a European and African or even two Europeans, you might well find them to be more different at other key points of the genome than you might find yourself with an indigenous Australian, with an Aboriginal Australian. Um, so it's it's kind of one of these things where it's a bit of a tricky thing because yeah, it becomes really tempting to say, oh, we are genomes. Um, but the reality of it again is much more nuanced than, than that. Um, but yeah, it's just we can like I can say for instance, well, six percent of my genome is I don't know. It's, I, I actually have never looked at my genome, so these numbers are all lies, but 6% of my genome is Chinese. That's a bit weird. Um, but it's not, I, yeah, it's, 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 it's very tempting to, so it's very, I, I think all of us do it. It's very tempting to fall into that thing, but it's actually really understanding what, what that difference is and, and placing it in the context of other differences that exist between modern groups that is really important to really contextualize that, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, can, can I just ask a very, what I think is a very simple supplementary? What's the origin of the name Denisovan? The cave, the cave you were upon. I think I might have a. That's cave. the name of the cave. Yeah, yeah. so it's the Denisova cave in Siberia. And in fact, this is. Um, do I still have the cave or did I take it out? Oh, I took it out. I'm sorry. Um, it's a cave okay. in Siberia. It was. Um, the Denisovans are not officially recognized as a, as a taxon because there is no fossil for them, there is only genome. So they're one of these first. Um, when they were when the genome was published, everybody was like, the what now? Who? Um, we only knew about Neanderthals because we had a fossil record for Neanderthals. And so what people are looking for right now is the Nisoman fossils. I mean, how can we have a fossil? How can we have a genome for a creature for whom we have no fossils? Mm. Um, and so right now they're called Homo Denisova, but whether that name will stick or not, we'll find out. We'll take just Thank a couple you. of uh, further questions, and I hope they could be. Uh, reasonably quick. Um, Igar had one, Tony has one, and I think Stephen has one. Uh, Igar, are you there? Uh, well, uh, Tony, would you like to ask yours? Yes, thank you. Um, Irene, you've showed, uh, shown us two waves of migration through um, these uh, islands and Australia. Were there more migrations of different people after that? Uh, historical, so that's a good question. I would say, I mean, in historical times, you're going to have migrations associated with sort of 
you know, normal historical processes, warfare, warfare and things like that. But large scale migrations, I would say no. These are the sort of the real, like the sources of present day populations in, 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 these, in these places. Okay. Yeah. And Igor has said he's got no audio uh, tonight. So he just wanted to follow up Irene on the question that uh, Philip asked and that was, could he assume because he believed he was totally European that he would have no Denisovan even uh, genomic material. Oh. And, uh, and Igor said, well, you know, Asians uh, invaded Europe with Genghis Khan. And so yeah. did the, did your statement still hold? My statement still holds, yes. It's, it's a good yeah. caveat. Um, I think it really depends well. So if you were Inuit, I would take it back. If you were um, perhaps Estonian or Pino Greek, I might take that slightly back. But for the most part, if you were of Northwestern European stock, yeah, no, I'm sorry, you're out of luck. Nothing. Thank you. And Steve, do you want to ask your question? Uh, thank you. Yeah. We can't hear you. I'm unmuted. Okay. Yes. yes, that's okay. good. Um, thank you, Irene. You you explained that um, cell function um, is selected by <clears throat> the configuration of the genetic uh, uh, elements. That um, that's right in that sort of pick in that sort of way. Now, how does this um, relate to the story where genes can be switched on and off by telomeres, which I think does not involve a, a, a reconfiguration of the whole molecule? Okay. Um, okay, no, that's a good question. I thought you were gonna ask me a harder question, so I'm, I'm very grateful for your question instead. Um, so th the whole process of gene regulation is, uh, is actually happens at many different levels. So the, the, if you think of it this way, you've got a cell that needs to turn on certain genes, but really should not be turning on other genes, right? Like an immune cell is interested in only turning on immune genes and it doesn't want to end up being like a half immune, half muscle cell. Um, and so there are many mechanisms in the cell that together contribute to keeping the cell stable in what it wants to be. And things like the shape is one thing. And then you might, you guys might have heard of epigenetics, whatever that means, that's another mechanism. There is a lot of sort of safe safeguards in the cell to keep it from, from losing its identity and they all come together. And so regulation is factorial. Telomeres are a more sort of larger scale check on cell health. So telomeres are actually located exclusively at the end of chromosomes. So where is my cursor? Hold on, there we go. Um, gee, gee, gee. So they would be located just right here. Oh, that's an arrow, sorry, wrong one. These are right here and right there. And what happens with telomeres? Telomeres are, are a check on the structure of the integrity of the entire chromosome, right? So if the chromosome breaks, like if, I, if it breaks right here, if it cuts into two, then this bit of the chromosome will not be protected by a telomere and this bit will not be protected by a telomere. There is only a telomere here and here. And when the cell sees that, when the cell sees the end of a DNA string without a telomere, it freaks out. It's not, it's not stable. It says oh, something really bad has gone on with the cell. And so we need to turn, we need to solve this problem. We need to solve the problem of broken bits of DNA. And so that's really the role of telomeres. Sort of they serve as a really gross, like large scale check on chromosomal health. They're not used for refined we should, like we're tuning of let's turn this gene off, let's turn that gene on instead. They're really used for saying, okay, the cell is looks healthy enough, we can let it continue to do its thing, whatever its thing may be, but they don't serve to specify cellular identity, if that, if that makes sense. On that note, I think we might draw the meeting to a close and thank Irene for giving us uh, so generously of her time and her skill and her understanding of this topic. I'm sure it's enlarged our understanding of our near neighbors, um, uh, the past and the present and made us curious about whether the future is going to throw up further genomic information that will help us understand uh, how we can uh, see our world and our and ourselves <coughs> functioning even better. So um, 
if you would join with me, please. Uh, with Zoom, it's quite hard, but if you could all uh, just uh, indicate uh, that it's been a very interesting evening. And uh, so thank you very much, Irene, and many thanks to your cat for the entertaining distraction as well. <laughs> I think he was there the whole time with his phone, oh, sorry. <laughs> so good night, everyone. Good night.